clean and repair a drain line. The worker collapsed in the bottom of the tank. A second worker attempted a rescue and was also overcome and collapsed. The first worker was pronounced dead at the scene and the second worker died two weeks later. The accident reenactment that you've just seen illustrates the hazards associated with working in confined spaces. Entrants may be exposed to oxygen deficiency, toxic atmospheres, fires, or explosions, and escape or rescue may be impaired by limited access or egress. Even a worker who sticks his head in a confined space is considered an entrant and may be at risk. With over two million workers entering confined spaces annually, the injury and death toll is high. Tragically, approximately 60% of these fatalities are rescue workers, workers who may not be aware of or not equipped for the hazards encountered. Because of these startling statistics, employers are now required to have a trained rescue team available whenever a permit required confined space entry is made. This may be an in-plant team or an outside rescue service. Safe and efficient rescue depends on personnel who have proper training and knowledge. To begin with, rescuers must know the specific hazards of the workspace so they can be prepared for the obstacles they may encounter. In fact, in-plant rescuers must have the same training required for authorized entrance. A rescuer who doesn't know what he's up against could jeopardize his own safety and that of the original entrant. Personal protective equipment is a must for all rescue teams. Respirators, gloves, and safety harnesses with lifelines. Make sure you're familiar with this equipment before attempting any rescue operation. It's also essential that rescue workers have the proper rescue equipment. Safety experts today recommend using a retrieval line to pull an injured worker from a confined space. This way, no one else will be exposed to the conditions that disabled the entrant. In some cases, alternative rescue methods may be used, particularly when retrieval lines would pose an entanglement hazard. Whatever method you choose, be sure to learn the procedure before attempting a rescue. Don't wait for an emergency. Rescue teams should practice making confined space rescues at least once a year. It's best to simulate an actual rescue operation in a space whose size, configuration, and accessibility are similar to the spaces you may encounter. As asphyxiation is the leading cause of death in confined spaces, entrants and rescuers should test the atmosphere before entry and monitor it at all times. Respirators should be easily accessible. Attendants can use simulated training to develop a systematic approach for working with rescuers. Keep in mind that attendants should never enter the space to attempt rescue. Attendants do the most good by working from the outside. They can attempt rescue with retrieval lines, contact trained rescuers, and tell rescuers what had happened in the space. Attendants are also responsible for keeping unqualified would-be rescuers out of the space. A simulated rescue operation is a good time to conduct emergency first aid drills. Appropriate first aid equipment must be readily available during all permit required confined space entries. Also, at least one member of the rescue team must maintain current certification in basic first aid and CPR. A well-prepared and well-equipped rescue team can make the difference between a successful and a failed rescue attempt. In fact, in most accidents reported, the entrance would not have been harmed if the proper rescue equipment and procedures had been available and used. Accidents do happen in confined spaces, but the death toll can be reduced by prompt action, knowledge, and training in the hazards of high-risk rescue. This is Claude Aikens reminding you that safety is your job too.